you here this morning and for all you fathers we want to say happy Father's Day and along that line as far as our announcements go today we will not have our normal afternoon meal or service in the basement uh, because it is Father's Day so just this morning and then we'll head our separate ways and continue on with whatever events and plans that we have uh, for the remainder of the day and then uh, here in about a month a little less than a month maybe July 9th we have a quarterly business meeting uh, that'll be in the afternoon after our meal downstairs and so that'll be coming up here very shortly other than that I think that is all the announcements we have right again just a reminder because I know at some point we're gonna be saying wow I can't believe it's here already but we do have a, a Maranatha group scheduled in November but November sounds like a really long time from here uh, but it will be here before we know it as far as some prayer requests that is what is on our app got updated over this last week uh, we added Sammy uh, some a medication change and having some difficulties uh, there and then Eliana was able to go home obviously with oxygen and a heart monitor but uh, a good praise there as well I don't recall is she around the 40 weeks then I don't remember what the I, I don't know if it said either but I don't remember what I think it was February that she was born, and I forget how early she was, but it was pretty early. I think it was late 20s, right? Yes. So it's possible she's not too far from full term. Yes, it is. Uh, is pretty amazing. Manny and Barry uh, not sounding too good for Brandy at this point. Uh, sepsis in the brain, and then obviously on hospice care. And then uh, the preems continue to update them as well. But any others? Yes. But she said they had put on full gear because she's in um, isolation because of the sepsis, but the door was wide open. And she said that seemed really odd to her. Yes. But um, they are still saying, and they told him yesterday, told Barry yesterday, that they could take her home on houses if they wanted to. Oh, wow. Wow. So they took her off the one medication to speed her part up and see if she gets along. I've never heard of such thing to be on medications to 
Speed it up. Speed it up. So they took her off one of them and see if that would help things. But she said it felt a lot better before they did either one of those. Wow. And she's going to specialists. Yes. Very confusing. That's that is unless maybe the the medication will help was it the ventricle side then speed up? And then she'll just have tachycardia. Am I saying the right words, Kate? Yeah, that's not good. Yes. Huh. Continue to pray for her. Anybody else? I don't know that we have any. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Do Lord, we thank you again for your goodness. I thank you that you are aware of the needs. Certainly they're on our screen. Certainly even those that aren't on our screen, you are aware of those as well. I pray that you be with the ones specifically mentioned here this morning. Pray that you be with Sammy. And uh, just that they be able to determine uh, the next steps for this, with this medication. And what has been changed seems to have some serious side effects for her. I just pray that they be able to balance that all out and, and uh, uh, get, get back to where she was once before. And uh, I pray for Eliana and certainly her parents as... Now this little one is at home, and and uh, even just the the nerves that can go along with that as as parents with a a child with some needs, I pray that you would uh, give them the grace, the the rest that they need, and uh, just we do thank you for just the uh, uh, amount of 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 change, of growth, of improvement in health that has taken place since this little one was born, and we thank you for that. We do pray for Brandy, and certainly. Uh, Perhaps a little different than what was expected, but I, I just pray that you continue to give the doctor's direction and certainly be with Barry as well as he has those decisions to be made. And I just pray that uh, whether she stays in the hospital or comes home on hospice, I just pray that you'd make that clear either way and and uh, I just direct in, in that as well. And we just pray for the uh, preems and certainly their ongoing requests there and the Ukraine and certainly the the needs that they face on a daily basis as far as uh, those that surround them. And I, I pray that you continue to use them as light, as salt, and uh, to be able to reach hearts uh, when they're at their softest. And uh, I just pray that you continue to have an open door there for them, uh, that they be able to minister and, and uh, be your ambassadors uh, there in a, in a difficult part of the world at this point. We thank you for that. And I pray that you be with Barbara as well, certainly some confusing information here this week. I pray that as they uh, make some changes and, and adjustments and new medications, I pray that they be able to uh, remedy this, this AFib. I pray that you would give her uh, just the rest in you that can only come from you, uh, despite hearing what's been going on. And I pray that you be honored uh, in, in all the decisions and the steps of that as well. For the other requests, certainly that we haven't mentioned, but still on the screen, the other requests that haven't been mentioned but still in our hearts, uh, I just pray that you would continue to do a work and that we continue to be uh, bold enough in our faith to follow after you, even when it's difficult to see from one end to the other. But we thank you for what you will do. And as we continue on here in a moment with our tithes and our offerings, I pray that you bless the gift and the giver and that you would direct us as a church as we continue on in your work here in Tulane. In Jesus' name, amen. Very good. You want to stand here as we sing our hymn, hymn number 352, My Hope is in the Lord, either in your hymnals or on the screen. Let's stand as we sing.
of all might, at Calvary for me. seated. This time we have special music.
morning we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, just looking at a couple of verses. Well, we'll look at quite a few verses, but two in specific, or three actually, as we look at the challenge of dads, uh, the, I don't want to say the difficult part of dads, because certainly moms have this just as much difficult uh, in this day and age, uh, but I think there's some challenge that was given to Timothy so many centuries ago that is just as applicable to us today. Uh, in being uh, godly men. And uh, before we dive into these verses here in 1 Timothy 6, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. I pray that, again, you'd allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase. I pray that we'd be able to comprehend not only the times that we live in, but uh, the importance that we have to stand for you. And uh, I pray that you would challenge each one of us, uh, certainly the fathers, the dads, the men in this room, uh, but for all of us, that we'd be able to understand the, uh, just the challenges, uh, the temptation that we have to, uh, to complacency. And I, I just pray that you would uh, just be with our time now as we look to your word. And I pray that you'd be honored as we do. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of, uh, of news events of, of recent days. Actually, this first one is... Uh, quite some time ago when it actually happened, I believe 2019, but it's still going through the courts today. And uh, bear with me as I read it all. I know that the, uh, the topic is somewhat um, questionable, we'll say it that way. Um, but the outcome, the, the conclusion, I think, is what is really important uh, in, a, in a frightening way, if I can say it that way. Uh, we have this guy. He's from, uh, from England. Uh, a Christian UK doctor was fired for refusing to use trans pronouns, again, is appealing his case, according to a news article. A Christian doctor in the UK who lost his job for refusing to use a hypothetical patient's preferred pronouns is appealing his firing once more after being vindicated by a medical counsel. Dr. David Macareth, 60, lost his job at the Department of Work and Pensions under the National Health Service four years ago. Now, none of those titles seem to make any sense to us, but because we're dealing with something across the pond, not here. He confessed that he could not ref refer to patients by their gender identity instead of their biological sex during a work training session because of his Christian beliefs. Macarest said that his supervisor pressured him to refer to a man that was six feet tall with a beard as a she and Mrs., and he refused. His employer declared that failing to do so would fall under harassment under UK law and fired Macareth from his role as the health and disability assessor, uh, the Christian Legal Center said in a press release. It almost seems like we have a Christian Legal Center, but this one is spelled uh, T-R-E there at the end of center. After losing a previous appeal, Macareth is appealing his firing again to a European court after a medical counsel said this week that his beliefs did not make him unfit to serve. Macareth has been practicing for 26 years when he lost his job, uh, in 2019, he filed a lawsuit against his former, former employer for religious discrimination, but lost his claim before the employment tribunal just three months later. Notice this, it says the tribunal ruled back several years ago that his biblical beliefs on gender were, and I quote, incompatible with human dignity. And uh, I saw that phrase and I thought, seriously? A, a belief in the word of God is incompatible with human dignity. The, the reality is, and if this were January, we would be discussing the point that we've got to stand on God's word because that's the only place where there is dignity for human life. And uh, now we're being told over there in Britain, but I don't think it's too far from here, uh, that uh, a, a biblical belief is now incompatible with human dignity. His biblical beliefs then are, are kind of summed up. The Christian Legal Center in the UK is continuing to fight for his job. The article concluded with a quote, and I think I have, maybe I have this. Uh, David Macarest's case challenged the sanity of our society and our society was found wanting. We welcome the official conclusion by the GMC. Obviously, they ruled that he, hadn't, he wasn't harming anybody, uh, and so he should be allowed to practice, but his employer and uh, the tribunal is still not, following after. But here's the last statement. But the freedom to hold a belief but not express it is no freedom at all. I may have, there we go, there's the quote I just read. The freedom to hold a belief but not express it is no freedom at all. 
That's from the Christian Legal Center kind of summing up that court case. You know, that could be said of probably a lot of things here in the States as well. We're still allowed to have biblical beliefs, uh, but the ability to express them is many times being called in to challenge. And uh, as they say, with the freedom to hold a belief but not express it, it it's not freedom at all. Uh, it's not freedom if you, can, if you believe something but you can't share it, you can't live it, you can't say it. Another article and the same story concluded this way. Genesis 127 states, God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. Unless otherwise overturned, it is a considered legal opinion of a UK court that declaring that the human race bears the image of its creator is tantamount to a hate crime. Another article uh, from Breitbart on the same story titled, the title was simply, UK court rules biblical belief in two sexes incompatible with human dignity. Obviously, again, this is from the UK, and so we can't uh, raise the red flags yet here, uh, but I think it's coming. The Washington Post article stated that the death penalty uh, was incompatible with human dignity. I know that there's well-intentioned believers on both sides of that argument, uh, but I just thought that was interesting. Uh, another UK health worker lost a job for the same issue as uh, this, this man, David Macareth. Uh, this one was just a couple years ago. It is an article on that is quoted as saying, a full employment tribunal now is pending, and NHS lawyers are arguing Walker's Christian beliefs are, quote, not worthy of respect in a democratic society. You hear that? Walker's Christian beliefs are not worthy of respect in a democratic society. And again, we can say, well, that's England. They've got their own problems. Um, but it's coming. What is sad is there's a third case in the UK. Today, a UK employment tribunal judge ruled that the belief that biological sex is immutable, meaning unchangeable, and that it is impossible to change one's sex is incompatible with human dignity and the fundamental right of others. A, uh, a Breakpoint Colson Center, uh, founded by Chuck Colson, has an article entitled, Is Christianity Now Incompatible with Human Dignity? And I wasn't sure where, uh, obviously Chuck Colson, I don't believe he's even alive, yeah. But I wasn't sure where kind of an evangelical organization would stand on that, and I was afraid to read it. But the, the conclusion basically was is, uh, that, we sh that pretty much what I just said. Human dignity is found in the Word of God and really nowhere else in society. And uh, so we've got to be able to stand for biblical truth because that is the only means of true human dignity. But it begs this question, are we ready to stand for truth when it is being called into question? Men, are we ready to stand for truth? And when I say men, I even mean, I think Josiah, well, uh, we have Michael, but Josiah as well would be two of the youngest ones in this room. Um, are we ready to stand for truth even when our truth that we stand for is being declared as, quote, incompatible with human dignity? Do we have that kind of fortitude? Do we have that kind of uh, drive? Do we have that kind of boldness to be able to say, and regardless of what the topic is, and I know the, there was a common theme going through those court cases in England, uh, but if, if they start there, I guess I can say it this way. If there is a biblical truth that they can say is incompatible with human dignity, where do they stop listing biblical truths as incompatible with human dignity? In other words, we can state that one, but then when it comes to the next topic, and then the next topic, and the next topic, uh, uh, certainly where do we stop then? Once it's been declared, it's kind of an open book from there on. I know more and more church denominations are giving up and, and giving in on the, the pull of society, but I think what Paul is challenging Timothy here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, I think is regardless of the direction of society, and it's a challenge, three points, uh, three commands, three actions uh, that we as men have got to be willing to take in order to continue to stand even when our beliefs are being called into question. And that doesn't mean that we should be, what am I trying to say here? It doesn't mean that we're removed from the consequences of that stand. You know, I'm going to stand for Christ, that means I shouldn't be held accountable for that. No, I think we stand for Christ and we uh, acknowledge that there's going to be some accountability in that way. And uh, if laws continue as they are, there may be some pretty harsh account accountability in that regard. But we've got to be willing to stand even when it's not popular, even when it's not friendly, even when it's not acceptable in, in our nation. So three things 
that we need to do as far as being a godly man. Uh oh, I could have shown that one. That was just the uh, headline of another article. Uh, I call it leading from the front line, if we can say it that way. Uh, you know, the, the best way to, to lead um, in a situation like this is to be the one standing up. Uh, we can call it the front line, you can call it leading from the back, however you want to describe it, but truly being a, a man of, of leadership, a man after God's own heart, uh, begins with a, a first action found in verse 11 of, of flee. It says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. Obviously, before we can fully understand the statement, we have to know what these things are that, that we're to be fleeing from. Uh, but notice, first off, that the recipient of this charge is a man of God. So if, if we are a man of God, if we're striving to be a man of God, if we want to be a man of God, if, if that is our objective and our goal for our life, there are some things that we have to flee. Uh, this word flee is fugo, which in the Greek just even sounds like a bad word. <laughs> Uh, it just sounds like something that you wouldn't do. It sounds like something that's not a normal routine. Uh, uh, it literally means to, to run away. Last Sunday in the afternoon service when we do our uh, This Day in History, I actually had a devotional on, the, on uh, John Wayne, uh, of all people. And I have a sign, I forget exact words of it in my basement, uh, in, from John Wayne, and it says something along the lines of, of courage is... Uh, Courage is not the absence of fear, but it courage is the ability to saddle up when you are afraid or something, which is even more ironic now that I know that John Wayne actually did not like horses. Uh, and, but a, a few years ago, a, a term was coined, and I even had a message on it several Father's Days ago, on toxic masculinity. A mental health page states this, toxic masculinity refers to the notion that some people's ideas of manliness perpetuates domination, homophobia, and aggression. Toxic masculinity involves cultural pressures for men to behave in a certain way, and it's likely this affects all boys and men in some fashion. This idea that men need to act tough and avoid showing emotions can be harmful to their mental health and can have con serious consequences for society. Psychology Today, which is certainly not promoting them in any way, but uh, they give five kind of uh, uh, actions of, as they say, toxic masculinity. Number one, a man should suffer physical and emotional pain in silence. Secondly, a man shouldn't seek warmth, comfort, or tenderness. These are things that they say is a, how men act today that is actually toxic for themselves and society. Uh, the first one, suffering in silence. Honestly, uh, most men don't suffer in silence. Uh, probably we could address that on Mother's Day, but I would guess that most, most women would say, yeah, that's, that, that, that's not a thing. That's not how this works. Uh, but secondly, a man shouldn't seek warmth, comfort, or tenderness. If you want to be a manly man, you can't seek warmth or comfort or, or, or tenderness. And they say that, that's toxic. Thirdly, a man should only have the emotion, should only have emotions of bravery and anger uh, as well. You know, it's certainly, uh, if, if you want to be a man's man today, according to what they are claiming, men today say you can only have uh, uh, a bravery and anger. Only two emotions that men can show, and, and that's toxic. Any other emotions are weakness, and weakness is unacceptable, they say. Fourthly, a, a man shouldn't depend on anyone. Asking for help is also weak. Now, I do know that us men, proverbially speaking, have a difficult time asking for directions and asking for help in that way. Uh, and fifthly, a man should always want to win, whether in sports, work, relationships, or sex. Uh, these are five things that they say, here's what's wrong with men. They believe these things are to be true. A man should always want to win, whether in sports, work, relationships, or, or, or sex. Certainly when we think about uh, a, a man, and I just can't imagine any man saying, I'm really hoping I can lose today. I, I can't imagine uh, heading to the basketball court, you know, this afternoon, a bunch of dudes going, I hope we lose. Or, you know, ball games yesterday, uh, a, a guys, even a young kids, young boys sports team saying, uh, the coach giving, the, you know, before the game, pep rally, all right, guys, you're going to try really hard to lose today. Uh, but the thought of winning and the drive to win is considered toxic masculinity. Uh, going back to John Wayne, I, I would dare say that if you described all five of those sentences to John Wayne 50 years ago, uh, at least as he came across in the, uh, the, in the movies, if you would explain to him that those five things are bad, 
I think you would have had him pull your shirt up from behind you right over your face and he would have just picked you up and thrown you in the horse trough uh, and the conversation would have been done. But today those thinkings are, are uh, considered toxic. They need to be avoided. They're bad for us and they're bad for society. And where's the Christian left today? So are those things bad or are they not? Uh, should we be standing for that or should we not be? Are they bad or should we realize that uh, I know there's some things that we need to do and, and there's a lot of question marks and, and uh, things that we used to kind of, in very general terms, define manlyhood and manliness. Uh, I guess manhood would be the correct word. Manhood and manliness uh, uh, are now being defined as something that is really bad. And I think a, a godly man is left asking himself, so who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do? So, so what is the direction that, that I should go? Well, I can say that one of the first things that Paul challenges Timothy, a young man left in a very difficult situation, is the command to flee. And whether or not we agree with the last five things that psychology today defines as toxic, I, I would say that one thing that is difficult for men to do today as a whole is a thought of retreat. Maybe it goes to that last one, a man should always win, or at least should always want to win, is what it says. And so back in, or, or literally as the word in the Greek means, to turn around and run, is certainly not something that uh, is, is uh, considered manly. You know, I think back, in, sticking with the TV illustrations, I think back to old uh, Andy Griffith and um, dear Barney Fife, who's taught so many police officers how to be real men. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think back to him where even in his fear, Barney usually stood strong. He was maybe shooting his foot or, or uh, shooting his mouth and, and uh, not really helping the scenario at all. But I can't really think of too many times where Barney just turned around and ran. He wasn't necessarily doing the right thing, perhaps. Uh, uh, but there was a, a, a tendency that, 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 that we don't turn, we don't run. But it says here, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. So what are these things? Verses 1 and 2 of this chapter goes back to a, a social thing that was going on in that day, not necessarily today. Uh, interesting that as uh, we have a federal holiday now tomorrow. Um, but anyway, it says, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. The name of God and his draft should be not blasphemed. What would have been the norm? What would have been society's norm of that day? If you were a servant, what was the expectation how you would think about your master? Not in pleasant ways. And uh, Paul started out this chapter by saying, all right, if you're a servant, you must think well of your master. That doesn't mean that they're going to treat you well, but you must think well of them. That was a complete break from societal norm, if we could say that. Verse 2, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Now, here's the, here's the temptation. I can use this as an illustration. I've had numerous jobs over, over the years, and uh, I've had new jobs that I worked for those that were saved, and I've worked for those that were not. Probably more unsaved bosses than saved, by far. Um, but I can say one of my worst jobs that I had, and it was had it very shortly, um, was for a, a man who professed to be a Christian. It was the most miserable job that I have ever had, and I hope I never have one like it ever again. Uh, because the person proved very quickly that who they were on Sunday was not who they were in business hours on Monday. And uh, it was kind of startling uh, uh, for me uh, to see such a difference in Christianity from Sunday to Monday. And it was a, a very different person, and his attitude and his treatment of customers, treatment of employees, uh, his uh, ethics, I guess we could even say, uh, were all quite questionable. And, and uh, I, I just remember thinking, this is not how this should be. Well, verse 2 is simply saying this. All right, so verse 1, if you are a servant, treat your masters with respect. Even though they may not respect you, you treat them with respect. Verse 2, though, says, So those of you that are Christian, part of the church, part of the church of Ephesus where Timothy is, that are Christians who are servants, and you have masters who are 
Christians as well. You go to church services together, but after now as master servant, it, it, it says, don't disregard them. Don't think less of them because of how they treat you. Now, I would say human nature is, wait a minute, you should be treating me a little bit better because we're brothers and sisters. We're brothers, hopefully in this case. We're brothers in Christ. Therefore, you should be treating me with some respect, with some dignity. I'm made in the image of God, as are you. But Paul challenges verse 2 that even when you have Christian masters, you need, almost need to go, he's almost saying you need to be even more diligent in your service to them. Because... They are brothers in Christ. That, again, goes against the norm. That, that's, that's not the normal thing. Verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to be wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. In other words, if you disagree with that, Paul says, you know, what a statement. This is obviously the word of God. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. But what a statement. Paul says, all right, here's, here's societal norm. Here's what you need to do as a child of God. And if anybody tells you differently... It's because they have pride in their life. Don't go that way. That, that's some pretty harsh statements. Verse 4, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, wherefore come with envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such. Withdraw thyself. But godliness with what? Contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And we, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that are will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and in a many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee those things." Flee those things, those socially accepted ways, and those, we can begin in verse 3, the normal response of uh, biblical concepts that we conclude are incompatible with human dignity. Uh, what Paul is saying is when someone defines a biblical truth that I've just given in verses 1 and 2 and says, no, that's not the case, that's not how this goes, you need to withdraw yourself from them, verse 5. You need to step away because they're in sin, they're in pride, they're they're fighting over words and they're fighting over concepts that they ought not to be fighting over. And we look at a society today that I know that it's just a matter of time that here in this nation there's going to be articles written that say, you stand for biblical truth and that is incompatible with human dignity. We're dealing with a very different topic than the first six or five verses of 1 Timothy chapter 6. But the concept, the application, the truth is still there. Hey, here's the biblical truth. And if someone says anything contrary to that, don't follow them. Don't agree with them. Instead, verse 11, run from them. Flee from those things. Or stand true to the truths of God's word, even when it is difficult to do. Even when you're the servant being, mis being abused by the master who you happen to know is a child of God, you go the extra mile because he is a brother in Christ. Don't hold them in uh, frustration and anger because they're not living the way they should. They're not treating you the way he sh should. But go the extra mile in service to them because he's a brother in Christ. That's not normal. But anything that contradicts that needs to be run from. You know, men, we have to learn how to flee some things. Uh, I know it's the easy temptation as the number five in the list of things that make toxic or make masculinity toxic is we like to win. We don't back down. We don't step away. We don't turn our backs and run for our lives. But we've got to learn that there's some things that we need to flee from. And if we want to be a man of God, verse 11, I've got to first know what it means to turn around and run. Flee these things. I don't know that David, what was his name, David Macareth. I don't know his story. I don't know his heart. I don't know his salvation testimony. I don't know where he goes to church, obviously. I don't even know where in the UK the guy lives. But I know, what did I say? He was a, a doctor for 26 years, 
And in a training exercise, his boss said, you need to call that six foot whatever guy with a beard a female. And he said, I can't. I can't do that. I have a religious belief that says I can't do that. Now, in all seriousness, this was a training exercise. This wasn't a real patient. This wasn't a real scenario. Uh, this was just a training exercise. But yet his biblical belief was such that he said, I'm running from what you've asked me to do. I have to stand true to the word of God. I have to stand true to what is right. And I can't call, I can't imagine, I can't call a six foot something guy with a full beard a ma'am. I can't do that. Because I have a belief in the word of God that won't allow me to. Stand strong means sometimes running from uh, what we're being asked or being told that we have to do. We continue on in verse 11. It says, but thou, thou, O man of God, flee these things. Well, then it says, follow after. You know, retreat is, uh, retreat is a hard thing to do. Running from something is a hard thing to do. Uh, uh, especially as a guy, I think it becomes more difficult. But I think even ladies at times have a difficult time running away from something when they, uh, especially uh, you got that mama bear mentality. You're going to stand and fight to the death if necessary. And, and so I think all of humanity to a point has a difficult time fleeing. But there is a reality of, of fleeing is not the end goal. It's not the end means. It's not, you know, we have to know where we're fleeing to. We have to have an objective. We have, a, we have to have a course. Uh, we obviously as a church have gone over our evacuation plan and probably should review it. Uh, but if we have to leave this building quickly for whatever reason, there's a location that we will meet. And, and why? Because we want to be able to uh, uh, have a plan. We not have an objective. We have a meeting place so we can say, hey, we're all here. We all made it. Because otherwise, where do we, where do we go? We're, if we're just told to leave the building, well, some of us are just going to get in our cars and go home. Some might run north, east, south, or west. And uh, how, how do, uh, wh where, where are we going? What are we, what's our objective? What's objective number two? What's goal number two? So I'm going to stand for truth, which means turning and fleeing from uh, uh, discontentment, fleeing from the mentality that says, wait a minute, I deserve more. So we're going to flee from that thought, but where are we going from that point? Because we don't want to just be godly men that are just running away from everything. We've got to have something that we are following after. And so he follows up the flee from with a follow after. And a number of things are, are given. Pursue, number one, righteousness. I, I didn't have the room to put all these little bullet points here, but you can see them in the verse 11. Follow after righteousness. We know that our righteousness is as filthy rags. We know that it is his righteousness that has been imputed, put on our account, and uh, those are understandings that we need for salvation. But to be told to pursue righteousness or to live righteously, this involves daily living on our part to do what God has called us to do. I'm going to flee the temptation of normal society, we could say, the thinking that we're leading ourselves, hey, this is what is the norm now, this is what is acceptable, this is what we're going to define as right when as Romans chapter 1 says that which is right is now called wrong and that which is wrong is now called right when we're living in those days I've got to flee that which truly is wrong even though they're saying it's right I've got to flee from that but I've got to instead pursue after righteousness it's the evidence we could say of living out the fruit of the spirit it's the evidence of living out what true faith really looks like what true love really looks like. What true endurance and patience truly looks like. How does my discontentment, how does my pursuit of money impact my righteousness? <laughs> that's the concept, that's the, the, literally the, the, the text that surrounds this verse. If we did not pursue all those things, other things in our life, whether it be, I want more, I want bigger, I want better, I want newer. What if we were wise stewards of what God blessed us with Will we suddenly have more to be used for what God wants to bless us through and use through us? Pursue righteousness. Flee from the things of society. Be willing as men of God to be able to realize there are things I have to step away from. I have to back off from. It's, it's not the John Wayne thing to do. But we've got to back up. 
But in our backing up, we've got to realize that we're backing away from this. And as we turn around and run, ahead of us now is righteousness. Follow after that. Secondly is godliness. Well, we can say, what's the difference between righteousness and godliness? It seems to be pretty, pretty close to the same. I'm going to define it this way, and you can argue with it if you'd like. But I'm going to say that righteousness is more of the outward. Our righteous acts, our righteous works, whereas godliness is from the heart. It's who we are on the inside. It's pursuing the image of God within us. The heart, the mind, the drive, the motive. Are we pursuers of godliness? What is the motivation behind our living? What's the motivation of us being here today? Do we pursue number three, faith? This is painful. Faith is simply a trust and obedience in who God is and what he has said. What is the biggest threat to my faith today? I can do this on my own. That now what verses 3 through 5 are talking about. I can figure this out pretty well myself. I've been around the block a time or two. I've had an education. I've learned a lot, uh, whether it be in the classroom or on the street, and I, I think I got this covered. You know, pursuing faith means I've got to set aside not leaning on my own understanding, but trusting in my God. That's a true pursuit of faith. Uh, it's easy to turn from faith, although we never say that, oh yeah, I'm going to turn from faith. I'm going to retreat from faith. But if I'm going to turn from that which is before me, and I turn around, I realize that ahead of me now is righteousness and godliness and faith. And it continues on, pursue after love. First Corinthians 13 talks a lot about love. Love is a mechanism by which all of our other spiritual gifts fall. Uh, if I don't have love, then it doesn't matter what my abilities and and uh, my, my spiritual traits are, if I don't have love, then I'm, I'm, I'm like a, a, a brass instrument that makes no noise. We know this verse, Luke chapter 10, verse 27, and the answer said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? All thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Pursue that kind of love. Loving yourself is not listed. I was going to mention this in the announcements. I forgot. My wife is wanting to start a, uh, a, a girl's Bible study. If you're a teenager or recently have been one, uh, they're going over a book that we really actually found by accident. And uh, I had my wife check it out of the library through interlibrary loan. And uh, as she's quoting some fast, she's just one of those books where every page that she's reading, she's like, oh, wow, this is really well said. And she quotes it to me. And I'm like, wow, that actually was pretty good. And then the next page is another one and another and uh, so then discuss me like we, we should go over this with uh, with the ladies in the room. Uh, uh, there's some things that we need to grasp. Well, you know, one of the points of the book, kind of the essence of the entirety of the book, is loving yourself is really not a biblical command. We've got that taken care of. We know how to do that. Uh, we're never told to love yourself. That there's there's no biblical concept at all. That is First Timothy six something we need to flee from so that we can pursue after that which we ought to be pursuing. Uh, the loving, pursuing love does not begin with me. It does not begin with, well, I have to learn how to love myself so I can love others. No, you already know how to love yourself. Far more than we normally put into practice in loving others. We do. And we've got to be able to live that out uh, as well. So we need to pursue love. Uh, self-centeredness, that's something we need to turn from. Run the other way. Pursue patience. Literally means cheerful endurance. I really wish in the definition, the Greek definition of, of in verse 11 here when it says patience, I wish it didn't involve this word cheerful in the definition. Uh, uh, because we can all endure things, right? Uh, we, we can endure things. Uh, we were watching a, a, a TV show that we're watching online, and so we can watch a couple episodes now and then. And uh, the last couple of episodes we were commenting just has had a lot of screaming babies. Almost to the point of, okay, we've, that's enough. And I even commented to my wife, because obviously this is just drama. Uh, I said, you know, the, the real mother of that baby is off, off screen somewhere, and I'm sure that mother is going, 
Stop making that baby cry. Would you pick it up and love on it, feed it, whatever it needs, cover it up and warm it up, whatever the detail is that causes this baby to scream his head off. I'm sure there's a mom behind the camera saying, please hurry up with this scene. I need my baby. Uh, but you know, the, the, the truth is, is as this show is going on and there's some babies that are, are screaming their heads off, uh, to some extent or another, there's endurance involved, some better than others, better endurance than others. And obviously these, these are not actually, although on camera they are parents and relatives of the screaming baby, but in reality they're not. Uh, this baby does not belong to them, it's somebody else's baby. And so as the script goes, they have varying degrees of endurance. Well, you know, we can all endure to a point, right? Tomorrow morning I'm, I have to go to work and uh, continue to work throughout the week if the, if the Lord tarries. And there's certainly times in, in the course of a day's event, I would dare say for all of us, that we say, this isn't fun. This isn't, a, this isn't I'm going to endure. I'm, gonna, I'm not just going to walk out the door and get my car and go home. Uh, I'll make it through the day, but this isn't a fun day. I have to admit there are days that I, I text my wife and I'll say, this would be a really great afternoon for a sweet tea, which is mostly code. I could really use a visit, and if you happen to bring a sweet tea with you, that would be even, even more better. <laughs> uh, so she'll come up with her smiling face and a, a, a sweet tea kind of hidden in her purse, and she comes into my office, and, and I, I, well, even while she's still there just chatting, that sweet tea's gone. And uh, suddenly, I don't know why, but suddenly now the afternoon looks so much better. You know, there, there's a something about endurance, about patience, but the reality in the Greek word, as Paul is telling Timothy, it involves the word, weird word, cheerful, cheerful endurance. I'm going to be happy about this. Oh, wait. That, again, goes completely against the social norm of today. I have to be cheerful about enduring. The very concept of endurance means I'm not enjoying this. I don't have to endure things I really like. I think there's some uh, some uh, uh, this afternoon. I'm probably not going to have to endure it. Now, maybe if it gets to the point where it catches on fire and it's burnt to a crisp and it's well done, I'd have to admit I'd have to endure that. Uh, uh, but I don't normally use the word endure. I use the word cheerful but not endurance, when I'm talking about eating some beef. But there are other things that we have to endure in, and if we're fleeing from the direction of society and turning and following after something that is contrary to society. You get the picture here? We're running, we are turning completely 180 direction, degrees in a different direction, and as we turn around now, there's something ahead of us that we are to follow after. Verse 11 gives a whole list of things. When you think that here's the temptation, I've got to go this way. Men, we've got to learn how to turn around and realize the things we need to be pursuing are actually now behind us. Turn around and go that way instead of the way that it seems to be going. Be it David Macarat that says, you know what, this is just a training thing. It doesn't probably doesn't really matter in the scheme of life. But I've got to turn from that. I've got to follow after what I know to be right. What is righteousness and what is godliness? And ultimately, we could even say, what is true love, actually? But I'm going to have cheerful endurance. And then lastly, it mentions the word meekness here in verse uh, 11. Gentleness, as the ESV says, which conveys kind of the meaning of, of the word. Let's consider it this way. Make, meekness involves a power under control. A lot of people define it that way. That brings us back to faith, to love, to cheerful endurance. But meekness also then involves an aspect of, of being humble. If we turn from that which is before us and realize that which we're supposed to be following after is, was behind us, now as we turn, it's in front of us. We have to realize that among all these other traits that we are now pursuing after, there's an aspect of humble meekness that we are to pursue. Are we heading in that direction? Man, we have to learn how to flee. Step back, back down. 
I know the, the image of uh, John Wayne, six foot whatever he is with uh, a, a six shooter on our hip and uh, dirt and dust on our clothes and uh, uh, what was one of his movies, True Grit. Uh, the essence of True Grit and even the nickname of Duke. Uh, it gives you that mentality that to be a man, we've got to be that kind of a man. But to be that kind of a man in God's terms means there's some things that I have to turn around from. I have to flee from. I have to follow after. And then to continue on the, 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 the same first letter here, we're going to continue on with a, a fight in verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Sadly, many within the confines of the body of Christ are in constant battle, but not the good fight of faith. Uh, what should we fight over? We have called a truce for the basis of unity on things we shouldn't be calling a truce on. And then we're fighting on the very things we should be silent on, if you, if you follow what I'm trying to say. The things that God calls us to stand for, to be contenders of the faith. Many times within Christianity, we call for a truce. Oh, we have to be united. No, oh, no. We have to be united on the word of God. We have to be united in Christ. But we're not to be united to each other simply on the basis of, of, of a complacent compromise. But then on the things that we should be silent about, that really aren't things that we're called to fight for, boy, that's where we, we put our dukes up on that one. And we'll fight them, we'll fight to the death if necessary on things that God never called us to fight for, but we've made them really important in Christianity. Fight the good fight of faith. Have you ever thought in a Christian walk, especially guys, have you ever thought in a Christian walk in the leadership that God has placed you in your own homes even, I wish this was easier? Have you ever had the thought of, why is walking according to the word of God so difficult for me? Why is this such a challenge? Now, I, I would assume you ladies have the same thoughts and uh, arguments with yourself. <laughs> uh, why is it to do what is right, to do what God has called me to? Why can't it be easy? Or, or, doesn't God say that he's going to be with us? He'll never forsake us. Shouldn't it just be easy to truly walk after him? Shouldn't it be easy to do what he's called us for? Well, if it was easy, I don't think verse 12 will begin with the word fight. And it doesn't just stop with the word fight, because Paul is not challenging Timothy just to be a fighter. But he says, fight the good fight of faith. The psychology of Paul, if we could say it that way, and I hesitate to use the word psychology for obvious reasons, but the psychology of Paul would be there's an aspect of agony that must be involved with our walk. If we have walked away from agony, if agony is one of the things that we've turned our backs on and fled for step one, then we're fleeing from the wrong thing. But we have to realize that when we turn from the norm of society and follow after what God has called us to, verse 12 follows next. There's a battle. It's a agonizo. It's a Greek word that means there's going to be agony in the fight. And I can tell you that sometimes we look at what's ahead of us and we turn around and we look at now what's ahead of us and we come back and we're like, well, this suddenly doesn't look so bad. Again, back to David Macareth. Again, I don't know. I, I keep referencing him and I know nothing about him other than what has been reported about him. But he could have said, all right, I'm not going to do that. And I turn around and I'm going to do what I know that God has called me to do. But, oh, wait a minute. That means I'm going to lose my job. It means I'm going to lose my financial security. He was a doctor for 26 years. Do you think there was some financial security he had? Some social? Not social security like we know today, but social security as far as socially. There was some security in what he was doing. He had a livelihood. He had a, a means, a business, a a, uh, a position of respect in society. He says, I can't do this. I'm going to turn and follow after what God. Oh, wait, but that's going to cost me. The temptation is to turn back around and say, well, this doesn't look so bad suddenly. Fight the good fight of faith. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says this. Thou therefore endure hardness. No, hardness is not something that we like to endure. It's kind of goes with the word cheerful. We don't, we don't like this. 
As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Flee, follow, fight. You want to be a man of God? Flee, follow, fight. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge that Paul gave to Timothy so many generations ago. <clears throat> that still apply to us today. I pray that you would challenge us as men, that we would truly be men of God, that we'd understand that there's some things we need to turn our backs on. And as we do, we realize that that which we ought to be pursuing is actually was behind us. But then as we measure the cost of following what we ought to follow instead of what we is easy to follow, I pray that we'd be able to weigh the cost and still continue on with the good fight of faith. Not for our own glory, not for our own gain, not for our own name, but that we bring honor and glory to you as a man of God. And I pray that you'd use each one of us here this week as you see fit, in whatever situation we find ourselves, that we'd be willing to stand and be a contender for the faith as we turn and flee from the, the pressures that surround us, that we'd be able to be a man who stands for truth. Come what may, we thank you for it and give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Just one verse, 477, channels only, 477. Let's stand as we sing. pray oh, we have some gifts for the dads we gave candles to the the moms at mother's day so we're going to give flashlights to the dad now i will admit these are not the brightest flashlights you've ever had in your life mostly because uh, those cost a lot of money um but i think it's a good reminder as well if i can spiritualize a uh, not bright flashlight if that if that makes sense uh you know there's a big difference when the world gets darker and darker that even a small light makes a difference and uh, I, I don't think that God has called us all to be Abrahams and Davids and Solomons and the list goes on, Pauls and Timothys. But he's called us all to be light. And that light, as we reflect his light, will always make a difference. And uh, so this, this has all kinds of fun gadgets with it, too, and it sticks to stuff. And, and so there's some, some fun to it. But uh, to be honest, I have, a, I have a hundred and some dollar flashlight at home that I put in my belt for police. And it's got so many gazillions of, of lumens, and it lights up our whole, our whole road at night if I need it to. This won't do that. But it will be what is necessary when you need it. And may we live that way as well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for who you are. I pray that you'd use us as light, as salt in the world that we live in today. And I pray when there's so much confusion going on and we certainly are now living in a day when that which is right is called wrong, when having a biblical uh, a mandate for our life is considered incompatible with human dignity. Uh, I pray that we'd be able to stand for truth even when it's not popular, that we'd be that kind of a man, that kind of a woman. And uh, we do thank you for the dads that are in this room. I pray that you would use them, strengthen them, and continue to uh, uh, guide their steps accordingly to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So you want to hand those out? You are dismissed.